this wonderful occasion of Palm Sunday. Uh, during the season of Lent, it's a very meditative, very solemn season in which we uh, reflect upon our sins and what that meant for Jesus, that he had to die for them. We kind of take a brief pause today for Palm Sunday. It's a joyous occasion, a joyous occasion in which Jesus came into his holy city for the purpose of dying on Friday for our sins. Uh, to help us along in our, our worship today to commemorate this special occasion, we're going to do something a little different today. Um, just in 30 seconds here, we're going to head out the side doors right here um, and congregate on the grass facing the door. I'll stand on the ramp, um, and we're going to carry on with a little portion of the service out there. And everyone's invited to carry a palm branch or a palm leaf out with you. And then as we sing, No Tramp Soldiers Marching Feet will come in, and we'll all lay the palms here on the altar before the Lord, kind of like they did on Palm Sunday. So if you would then... Follow me outside. So we follow the order of worship is found in the bulletin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. We read our Palm Sunday account from John chapter 12. The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. But join together in the prayer printed in the bulletin. O oh God, who through your prophets foretold our king's coming. We give you thanks for fulfilling your word, and we pray that you would use these palms to remind us of the day we entered Jerusalem. Bless us who bear them, and grant that we may rejoice in his salvation in the heavenly Jerusalem. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord of Hosts. He is the King of Glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. We'll sing our next hymn, hymn 725. You can find it printed in your bulletin. After we start singing the first verse, we can proceed in, lay the palms at the altar, and then proceed to your seats.
right? Continue with the confession and absolution on page 2. Blessed Lord, who always comes among your people for good, we confess to you that we are conceived and born sinful, and both by nature and choice have turned away from you. We have enthroned self-interest and pride as our kings, and they have ruled us as tyrants. We have failed to acknowledge your rightful lordship in our lives. Forgive us for Jesus' sake, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, turn our hearts this day to worship and follow Jesus, the one true King of kings and Lord of lords. The King has won your freedom. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. just what would happen on this Palm Sunday morning. It speaks about the king who's riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And what do these things mean? When Jesus rode into his city of Jerusalem, it was for a very particular purpose, it was so that he could die just a few days later on our behalf. The result of this is that just as Jesus marched into Jerusalem, the Lord tells us to return to him, and that we, likewise, will enter his heavenly kingdom. We, re we read from Zechariah chapter 9. <coughs> Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you so far, God's holy word. Our epistle reading comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Jesus would come into Jerusalem, 
and he came in the form of a man. Now, it was very important that Jesus was not just true God, but also true man. He had to be true God so that his sacrifice was of enough value to pay for the sins of the world. But he had to be true man so that he could really suffer, so that he could really be tempted, and so that he could really die. This reading from Philippians gets at that twofold nature of Christ, at the same time both holy God and holy man. Something we can't really wrap our brains around, and yet it's true. We read from Philippians. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. At this time I invite you to please rise and we'll join in confessing our Christian faith according to the explanation of the second article of the Creed. You can find that in your book. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sin, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death. He did this, that I should be his very own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in eternal righteousness, innocence, and joy, just as he is risen from death, lives and reigns in eternity. This is most certainly true. You may be seated for the next hymn, hymn 161. Grace, mercy, and peace belong to each of you, from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your fellow redeemed. The text for our meditation this morning comes from Psalm 118. We read verses 19 through 29. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. 
the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So far, God's holy word. Dear friends in Christ, fellow redeemed, in 2001, a baseball team from New York City took the entire world by storm. This wasn't the Yankees. It was a 12-year-old Little League team that was playing in the Little League World Series. Little League World Series is a, a summer baseball tournament that takes place um, having teams from all around the world participating, all in the 11 and 12-year-old age range. Now, this team from New York City was from the Bronx, and they were very popular. They were almost unbeatable, all due to their dominant pitcher named Danny Almonte. Danny was a five foot eight inch to five foot eight inch teenager standing on the mound. He threw a fastball that reached 79 miles per hour. He was much larger and threw much harder than any other kid his age in the entire world. No one could beat him. In fact, during the series, he faced 72 batters, struck out 62 of them. Just a phenomenal pitcher. Now, the only problem that Danny Almonte had was that he wasn't 12. He was actually 14 years old, and that's why he was so much better than the other competition. Turns out it's not fair to have a high schooler play against 6th and 7th graders. And this became quite the scandal. In fact, they went in later, later and, and scrubbed the record books. And now when you look, it says that this 12-year-old team from the Bronx forfeited all of their games. They didn't win a single one. Now, every so often, a, a scandal like this pops up in youth sports, where a team brings in a ringer to play for them. They bring in a player that's much bigger and stronger and generally older than the other kids a player that no one else can compete against. It's not fair. When substitutes are made, they need to be on the same playing field. The, it needs to be a level playing field. They need to be the same age, or else it's not right. Now this principle actually carries over to Jesus and his substitution that he made for our sakes. The overarching theme of all of Scripture is that Jesus gave himself as a substitute for us. He died in our place. 2 Corinthians 5 speaks about this. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded thus, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. Jesus came to be punished, to die, to give himself as a sacrifice so that we don't have to face the same. Jesus' death and suffering counts as if the rest of us died and suffered as well. Jesus came in as our substitute. But now when he came to be our substitute, he couldn't be only God. That wouldn't be a level playing field. He had to be fully human as well. He needed to go through the same temptations the same trials, the same suffering that we all face, and yet do it without sin. And then as our equal substitute, he took all the shame, the rejection, the beating, the bloodshed that was coming our way. He took it upon his own flesh. All of this he did so that we wouldn't have to face the same. Now talk about an unfair substitution. 
We're the ones that committed all the sins that are deserving of this treatment, and we're spared. Jesus, completely innocent, no one could bring a charge against him, and yet he's the one that bears it all, and he bears it in your name. And that's hard to hear. It's hard to hear that we are responsible for Jesus' death. And that's nothing new to us. We know that to be the case. We mentioned it last week in the sermon. It's as if we're standing there in the crowd shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Because we too put Jesus to death. And yet here's the twist. All of this unfair treatment of Jesus, the Lamb of God being led as a lamb to the slaughtering house, this was God's doing. God had decided to do this. That's what verse 23 of our text is pointing to. It says, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. That will serve as our theme for today. All of the events of Holy Week, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the, the rejection that he faced throughout the week, the plot against him, ultimately his death on Good Friday, all of that was what God had chosen to do. This was the Lord's doing. And the Lord's doing is always marvelous. May the Lord bless our study this morning. Now, as I was reading the psalm text, there was probably a number of different verses that jumped out at you as familiar verses. The, the final verse is the conclusion to our common table prayer. But I want to point you to another familiar verse, verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We say that um, sometimes. When we use it, we usually speak, we're usually speaking about the day that we're in at the moment. This is the day the Lord has made. Sunday, March 25th, 2018. Is this the day the Lord's made? Should we rejoice and be glad today? Yes, of course. What about the worst day that we've ever faced? The worst day that will ever happen in our lives? Is that a day that the Lord has made and we should rejoice and be glad in it? Sure, even in the worst days. And while that statement is true of every single day, it's especially true and is originally used to describe one day in particular. The day that the Lord had made. The day that the Lord had been directing all of the events toward in the world was the day that Jesus went to be the final substitute for our sins. The day that Jesus died for us and became our salvation. That was the day the Lord had made. And he had been planning for that day for thousands of years. All of human history led up to this particular week in which Jesus rode into Jerusalem and in which Jesus died. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sakes. The necessity of Jesus dying for the sake of sinners. God knew that had to happen before creation. Acts 2.23 This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you have crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. It was God's plan from eternity that Jesus would be delivered over to the hands of sinful men and be killed, thereby earning our salvation for us. Yes, this had been set in stone before Adam and Eve even were created. And so we see that everything from the day the world was created, leading all the way up to Jesus marching into Jerusalem, it was all centered around this pivotal moment in human history when Jesus began his walk towards the cross, riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. In this psalm before us this morning, there's several verses that are prophesying about different points during Holy Week. Starting with Palm Sunday, at verses 25 and 26, are prophesying about that. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. It's these verses that are actually being quoted by the crowd when Jesus walked into Jerusalem. If you remember from our John reading, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The first word of Psalm 125 says, Save us, we pray. If you were to pronounce that in Hebrew, it would sound like Hoshiana, Hosanna. They're, they're crying out to the Lord saying, Save us, we pray. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're directly quoting Psalm 118. You see, these people that were there, they knew who Jesus was. They saw him coming. It was just down the road that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead in Bethany. And they rightly deduced that this was the Messiah. This was the one that David was talking about when he said, Behold, he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, of course, they were saying the right words. They were shouting the right things. They didn't know what they were talking about. Didn't know the proper meaning behind the words. Sometimes we like to play peekaboo with, with my boys, and every once in a while, they'll, they'll make a noise back, and sometimes it sounds like boo, and it always cracks us up because that's the right thing for them to say during the game of peekaboo. Of course, they're not actually saying the word because they don't know what it means. They're just making guttural noises, and every once in a while, it comes out the right way. The people on Palm Sunday... They were saying the right words. They were fulfilling the prophecy from Psalm 118. They didn't know the meaning behind those words. They were confused about that. You see, it was a common misconception that the Messiah would come to save his people from the Romans. So they're saying, save us, we pray, from the Roman Empire. We know this to be true because Later on, just a few verses later in John chapter 12, Jesus is telling the people that he has to be raised up. He has to die on the cross. And the people were perplexed at that. That didn't fit in with what they thought the Messiah was coming to do. And so just a few verses later, it says, When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. No, they were welcoming their king into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, but they thought he would be a king who was going to free them from Roman oppression. This was the wrong idea. They did need to be saved. They did need to be freed. But it wasn't from the Romans. Now, the first verses of our psalm point to us exactly why they and we today need saving. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. The righteous will enter heaven. Heaven's gates are by nature closed to anyone who sins. If anyone loves themselves more than they love God and God's word, or if anyone fails to love every single other person in the world as much as they love themselves, this means they have been disqualified from heaven. Clearly, that's all of us. Now, if we showed up to the gates of righteousness and we presented before God our own records, the gates would be slammed shut. We'd be fast-tracked to hell. For us to enter into the gates of heaven, we needed someone else to open them for us. And that's why Jesus rode in on Palm Sunday. That's why he headed into Jerusalem. And he knew that every step he took on that donkey was taking him one inch closer to the cross. But also, every step that donkey took took him one step closer to opening those gates of paradise for each of us. Now, sometimes when you know that something is coming, something that you're really not looking forward to, a sense of dread kind of fills you. You just, you just, you just 
dreading the day that that looming um, unpleasant thing is coming. You think about if you've ever gotten your wisdom teeth out. In my experience, you know about it for a month or so in advance, and and you know it's going to be a couple weeks of painful recovery. And so as that day approaches, you just dread it. You just you just wish the dentist would change his mind that you could just cancel the surgery and not go through with it. Maybe you've experienced something similar when you have uh, college finals approaching or if you have to give a speech or uh, make some sort of performance in front of a large crowd. When you're doing something unpleasant and you know it's coming, it makes it that much harder to go through with. Jesus had to go through many unpleasant things to open the gates to heaven for us. And he knew exactly what was coming. Not just starting on Palm Sunday. He knew back before creation even began. He knew exactly the pains he must go through to earn salvation for us. Verse 27 paints a a pretty graphic picture of what would be happening to him. It says, Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. I was reading, as I was reading through the text earlier, you might have run across this verse and thought that that kind of stood out. It was put in pretty stark contrast with the surrounding verses. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And then sort of just sandwiched right in the middle. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar doesn't really seem to fit. And yet, it was necessary that that sacrifice happen so that any of these other statements have any meaning behind them, so that they're actually true. We can rejoice today. We can rejoice even in our worst day because Jesus has become our salvation. We can give thanks to the Lord and know that the Lord is good because he allowed himself to be treated as a sacrifice for our sakes. Yes, Jesus was the fulfillment of this. He went as the sacrifice and was bound to the horns of the altar when he was raised up on the cross for our offenses. And because of that, we can rejoice and be glad regardless of the day. Now, Jesus... Not only did he have to go and die on the cross for our sins, in the days leading up to his death, he also had to face a great deal of rejection and scorn. Verse 22 points to that. It says, the stone that the builders rejected. It's describing Jesus here. The plot by the very religious leaders who were supposed to be waiting for him to kill him. His friend who betrayed him for some pieces of silver the shame of being arrested and led away and put on a sham trial. All of this was part of the rejection that was coming for Jesus. And it was necessary that he go through all of that. Necessary that he be bound as a sacrifice because someone had to pay for what we were guilty of. And we were unable to do it. So God took the punishment on himself. Every single person who's ever born will die. Jesus was the only one who was born so that he would die. That was his purpose here. And now he has become our salvation. Through what he did on that first Holy Week, he opened the gates of righteousness for us through Jesus. We know this to be true, that God's light shines upon each one of us, chasing away the darkness of our hearts. Rather, the light of Christ is within us. And so as we work our way through Holy Week this week, may we each keep our focus on what Jesus came to do. He came to be our substitute. And to be our substitute, he had to be a fair one. He had to be fully human so that the temptations and the suffering and the death would all be very real. 
he had to face God's punishment. And now through Jesus, God no longer has any punishment left over for us. It doesn't seem fair. That doesn't seem right that God would do that. And yet, this was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes that God would do this for us. So today, let us give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love for you and I endures forever. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God which surpasses all our human understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. seated for the next hymn, Hymn 10.
prayer. Heavenly Father, as your Son humbled himself for our salvation, give to each of us and to every member of your church a confident faith in Christ's passion for us, so that during this Holy Week and throughout our lives, we would humbly entrust ourselves and all those whom you place in our lives to you. Heavenly Father, your Son promised that when he was lifted up, he would draw all people to himself. Turn unbelievers from their false gods to you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Work through pastors and missionaries. Give to each of us the courage to speak of our King who comes righteous and having salvation. By the power of your gospel, put faith-filled hosannas into the mouth of people who now live without you. Heavenly Father, in love for us, your Son became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Teach us to look to you in every temptation, so that drawing strength from you, we may resist Satan and our own sinful desires, obey your commandments, and care for all people as Christ cares for us. Dear Heavenly Father, come to the rescue of all who are sick, injured, facing surgery, or recovering from surgery. Help them, heal them, comfort them, and encourage them in the way that you know to be best for each of them. Lord of the Church, during this Holy Week, we call your people from around the world to follow you through your passion, death, and resurrection. Bless all who proclaim your suffering, death, and resurrection, that your flock would be fed and your glory revealed. <coughs> Into your gracious care, Heavenly Father, we place ourselves in everyone for whom we pray, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we also join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Hymn 162. 